I mentioned earlier that this is Stewardship Month, and so these next few weeks we'll be focusing on stories of giving and generosity, generally speaking. And we'll spend at least two weeks with the book of Ruth, maybe more. Ruth is a beautiful little story tucked between Judges and 1 Samuel. But Ruth isn't simply a story, and it isn't simply a story about giving. It's a parable. Now by that I mean that this story wants to turn the world of the reader upside down. It even tries to push your buttons. It tries to convince you to see differently. Or, if you share the perspective of the writer, it wants to strengthen your resolve so you won't wither in the face of opposition. Now, I've been expecting to preach on Ruth for a while. It's in the lectionary or set or schedule of readings for the fall. I moved it up a couple of weeks to fit my schedule Quite by accident, though, my preparation for this sermon lined up with some preparation for the Rural Immigration Summit that was held at Plymouth yesterday, which Shirley was mentioning in the announcements. This week, members of our planning team fielded calls from a few local citizens who were furious that we were, quote, aiding illegal immigrants in this way, and, quote, didn't we know that the reason the economy had fallen apart was Hispanic women were having babies in emergency rooms, unquote. Also, in our ignorance, our planning team made a mistake that has caused one foreign worker that we were working with to be afraid of retaliation towards her, and she has gone into hiding even more. This made it hard to ignore that Ruth is a story about a foreigner. Moab was a name for a place that carried negative moral and emotional connotations. It's like Samaritan or Gentile in other parts of the Bible, It's perhaps like Mexican or Hispanic or Latino today. Ruth is a part of a debate in ancient Israel, a debate that even enters into the Bible on the value and the place of the foreigner that is just as heated as any of the shouting we'll see on Fox News or MSNBC. When the people of Israel were taken into exile into Babylon, one of the natural consequences was that men started marrying foreign women. After a while, the Israelites were allowed to come back home. And so one of the natural consequences of that was they brought their wives, who were from Babylon, back home with them. And this caused a great deal of conflict and strife. And in Ezra and Nehemiah, books later on in the Old Testament, we see a debate, we see an argument for Jews to abandon the foreign wives they've taken. They're actually priests who are trying to purify Israel by sending these foreign women home. Now, that may sound a little bit familiar. We're having a version of that same debate today. To hear how the first chapter of Ruth may have sounded to an ancient Israelite audience, let me tell it like this. In the days when Obama ruled, credit froze, and the banks fell, and the economy crumbled, and the supermarkets, even the super Walmarts, closed, and no one had any money or food. A certain man from Los Angeles, city of angels, heard that there was still some food and work in Mexico. This man named God is King took his wife named Sweet and his two sons, one named Swine Flu and the other named Grim Reaper, to Mexico. Now these names are the modern equivalents of what these mean in Ruth. The stress was too much for God is King and once his family was safe, he died. Sweet's two sons, Swine Flu and Grim Reaper found work on a coffee plantation and fell in love with and married nice Mexican girls. One was named Maria and the other Christina. After a few years, not surprisingly, both Swine Flu and Grim Reaper died too. So that the woman Sweet was left without her husband and her two sons. While in Mexico for a few years, Sweet, after a few years, Sweet heard that the stimulus package money was starting to have an impact and that U.S. automakers had miraculously figured out how to make cars that ran on Skippy peanut butter alone. (laughs) The economy was booming. Now there was food and money and everyone was happy again. Sweet was too old to work on the coffee plantations and figured her only hope was to go find her cousin in a small town in Wyoming to see if she could help her. She traveled to the border crossing at Juarez with Maria and Christina and then turned to them and said, 
Thank you for traveling with me, but I can do nothing for you now. You know that we had our retirement funds invested through Bernie Madoff, and we lost it all. You don't speak English. You don't have the documents you need. I don't know how you would find a job. And not everyone in Wyoming will be nice to you. Christina understood, and she wept, and she turned and began to walk back home. But Maria said, do not press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There shall I be buried. Well, once Sweet realized that Maria was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. But she wondered silently what her cousin and what her cousin's neighbors in this small town in Wyoming would think as she stood on her doorstep with a woman from Mexico. Political tensions like this are a part of the Book of Ruth. And what happens is this Moabite, this foreign woman named Ruth, becomes the heroine of the story. The story challenges us to see that a foreigner can show loving kindness and loyalty and virtue as well or better than anyone else. It's yet another biblical story that challenges us when we start deciding some people are more human than others. The story breaks down those artificial, national, racial, and ethnic boundaries that we construct. All those things fall away until all we see is Ruth, a woman with courage and a heart as big as the ocean. Now, Ruth makes a foolish choice. Widows were extremely vulnerable in ancient Israel. Ruth doesn't have to be a widow. She could easily marry again if she goes back home. But she chooses the very real possibility of death over security. She puts it all on the line for relationship. She loves Naomi, is loyal to her, and to walk away from that love and loyalty is unthinkable. Ruth gives herself and is very willing to sacrifice herself for the sake of another. And this, of course, is the Christ act. It's the act we're called to emulate, and we see it lived here in this story. Ruth follows what her heart tells her to do, not what she's supposed to do. The story of Ruth encourages us to see the stranger or the foreigner as valuable. But then, it isn't really a story about loving the stranger. It doesn't tell us not to love the stranger, but it becomes a story about relationship, and perhaps our most important relationships. Ruth gives herself for someone she already knows and already loves. Ruth's relationship with Naomi is more important to her than anything else she might receive by going back home and finding security. Well, even after the modern issues of immigration fall away or native-born, foreign-born fall away, Ruth still wants to provoke us. It will still poke at us, prodding us to choose love over money and security, and that's, that's plenty, isn't it? Ruth will ask powerful questions like, where are those centrally important relationships in your life? Who are those people that you will give all for? Relationships with children, partners, parents, friends, members of the community. And then the next question is, are we giving enough of ourselves to those relationships? Are you giving enough of yourselves to those relationships? Ruth will ask. This last week I went to see the play Long Day's Journey into Night at American Players Theater. It's a relentlessly depressing play. If you ever have a chance to see this play, I recommend that you make sure your mental health is in tip-top shape before you go. So do some yoga, go see your therapist, something. I mean it, but make sure you're in shape because you're going to take a bruising as you go through that play. It's the story of a family. All four members of the family are tragic figures and every member is trying to blame the others for their problems. But I've been thinking about the father for obvious reasons, I suppose. 